Um, I think this is an exciting aspect of uh, the prep per project. We're going to talk about what does it mean to prescribe prep and please feel free to ask questions at any point in time. Um, and then we'll go over what it means to kind of be a prep champion. So just as a little bit of introduction for myself, my name is Leticia Lopre. I'm one of the principal investigators on this study, but I'm also an um, infectious diseases physician at University of Alabama at Birmingham, and I do a lot of research focused on how to increase PrEP access and specifically increasing it for populations that aren't currently getting PrEP um, in an equitable rates that we know would be necessary to end the HIV epidemic. And so the purposes of today's talk are to focus on one of these populations, specifically adolescents, and talk about the benefits of PrEP for adolescents living in Alabama. You're going to go through how to initiate and start patients on PrEP and what PrEP care looks like. And then we're going to talk about the different options for PrEP um, because there's different options that are available for different populations based off the populations included in clinical trials. You've actually already covered sexual history, so you should feel like you're fully empowered to do sexual history. So that's actually your day one and you're now on day two. So we always feel like it's important to give context and background as to why we are so passionate about what we're discussing. And so just as a little bit of background, we do know, as a disclaimer, adolescents do have sex. I think a lot of people uh, underestimate how often or how frequently adolescents are currently sexually active. And there's some data that kind of support that we have about half of adolescents, at least in high school, reporting that they at one point in time have had sex. And with this being a survey, this is usually intercourse in the way that they've conceptualized intercourse. And typically for adolescent populations, that means that they've had some kind of penetrative sex. And that doesn't include always oral sex and other modes of sex that we know can also um, be related to transmission of sexually transmitted infections. This is usually higher for females compared to men. Um, and when we look at our own personal data, so look at Alabama, we know 70% of Alabama high school students report being sexually active and not using birth control. So this means that not only are we having individuals who are engaging in sexual activity, but they're not using birth control while they're doing it. And then half of those individuals are also reporting not using condoms. And so specifically for adolescent populations, we know that it's important to have these conversations because not only are they sexually active, A, but also once they engage in sex, they're less likely sometimes to engage in sex that we think is safer sex practices, like using contraceptives or using condoms to present, prevent STIs. Um, so this is from that same survey. When you're looking at it, you ask adolescents, again, from a 2019 national survey database, are you currently sexually active? You see 43% of men said yes, 39% of women said yes. But then when you look at testing and how you've ever been tested, you'll see very few have ever reported being tested for HIV. Um, again, we already went over the condom use data, but you'll see that it's less for men compared to women. And then looking at ever tested for an STI, it's parallel. So again, I think we reviewed that the fact we know that people are having sex when they're in high school, but other protective acts that we know prevent HIV and STIs like testing are also not occurring in this age group. And then counter to that, when we look at who's most likely to be diagnosed with HIV, we're mostly seeing diagnoses in populations 20 to 29. And so really this 20 to 24 age, this late adolescence is when we're seeing diagnoses, which likely means that the infections are occurring before then. So we have ample opportunities to be talking to adolescents that we know are currently sexually active, not engaging potentially in sex practices that prevent STIs and HIV, and in populations that we know are most likely going to unfortunately bear the brunt of the HIV epidemic in future years to come. The other thing that we see is that there's huge racial and ethnic disparities in who gets diagnosed with HIV. And so this data is from 2019. These gaps are really kind of only widening. We've seen some improvements in regards to who's being diagnosed um, when we look at Black and Latinx communities. But we know that, for instance, among Black women, 
Black women are way more likely to be diagnosed with HIV compared to their white counterparts. And so right now, they're about 10 times more likely to be diagnosed compared to white women. If you look at Hispanic or Latina females, they're 3.8 times more likely to be diagnosed compared to their white counterparts. And these numbers are kind of paralleled in regards to Black men. And the population that we're specifically interested in is Black women, because we know there's just huge disparities in them actually accessing HIV prevention services like PrEP. And so shifting specifically and focusing on HIV prevention, when we're looking at our county, so what's happening within our state, the rates are actually going up in some of our more rural areas. One of the areas that we've really been looking at is Mobile, where we've been seeing from 2019 data, those rates increase. Most of the time when we report this data, we kind of leave out COVID because a lot of testing wasn't happening during that time. So we see a jump off and then we'll probably start reporting again now that we're back into the 2023. And then again, if you're looking at incidents for HIV among black women compared to white women in the state of Alabama, we still are seeing those mirrored disparities. So this isn't something that's only happening on a national level. A lot of times this is amplified in the South and it's also present within our own state. So something that we really should be, I think, anchored into and in trying to understand. I think that this, for people who do work in health disparities and health inequities makes sense. A lot of this has to do with structural access to care that does not occur um, a lot of times within more Southern rural communities and especially for communities of color. Um, but this is kind of what we're seeing as an outcome of this. And so one of the ways that we've tried to conceptualize, how can we really, from a holistic standpoint, improve HIV rates, is we try to say, we're not going to just focus on the diagnosis. We're going to try to think about the communities that are most greatly impacted. And you try to do that in a status-neutral approach. So with status-neutral approach, you say anyone who's been HIV tested, whether they're positive or negative, we're going to make sure that they have access to care. And specifically, if they're negative, we're talking to them and educating them about how to have pleasurable sex that's also safe and it would align with the goals that they have for sex to prevent HIV and STIs. And if they're positive, we're connecting them to treatment because we know treatment as prevention is real. And if you are HIV positive and you're on therapy, you're virally suppressed, you can not transmit the virus whatsoever. And so the major biomedical prevention strategies that are available, we just talked about this idea of U equals U, treatment as prevention. There's post-exposure prophylaxis. So if you've had sex with somebody, you know potentially that they have HIV taking HIV medication to prevent actual infection from the virus. And really what we're focusing on pre-exposure prophylaxis. So this is for anybody who's having sex and they wanna prevent HIV from ever happening. This is really very, very, very effective. And I think completely underutilized. It's actually been approved since 2012. Um, most people are shocked by that. So this has been around for over a decade. Um, Truvada is the original form of PrEP that was approved in 2012. It's approved for all populations, including adolescent populations. And this is based off of weight. So you'll see the 35 kilograms or 77 pounds. There's other forms of PrEP that's been approved, like Descovy, and even injectable PrEP, like Cavitegravir. So this is only going to increase in regards to our options for PrEP, but we really like to focus on Truvada because Truvada is our only generic option for PrEP, and that's that TDF FTC. It's amazing. It's $4, highly affordable. And this really, we just want to have a slide here that says PrEP works. There's some open label trials that have been done that have shown 100% efficacy if people take PrEP consistently. Um, for cisgender women for vaginal exposure specifically, it's been shown to be up to 95% effective if it's taken consistently. So if you're taking PrEP the way you're supposed to be taking PrEP and you're exposed to HIV, you almost 100% of the time do not get infected. So specifically for adolescent populations, looking at Truvada, TDF, FTC, the trial that really was the groundbreaking trial is kind of funny, um, only because it only had 78 people. <laughs> but this was the trial that they used to approve this for adolescent populations, and it included 
um, persons aged 15 to 17, and primarily um, people who were men who have sex with men are people who identify as being gay and bisexual or trans women. The main thing that they were looking at is that for TDF-FTC, they want to make sure that it was safe for your kidneys and that it didn't affect bone mineral density. Um, they also looked at whether it was efficacious in this population, and they looked at things like acceptability and adherence. And this part on the right is just showing you the breakdown of the population, the 78 men that were enrolled and trans women that were enrolled in the study. And it was a fairly diverse group of individuals, so they did a good job with recruitment. So what they found in this trial was, number one, it is safe. That's why it was FDA approved for adolescent populations. So no issues with bone mineral density, no issues with kidney function. Um, TDF, FTC, or Truvada actually causes a little bit of weight loss. Most people don't mind that. <laughs> so I don't usually tell people to be concerned about it. Um, they did have three seroconversions that occurred. It was all in people who had poor adherence. So people who were taking less than four doses in a week. And what they found specifically for adolescent populations is that number one, because this was trans women and um, gay and bisexual men who have sex with men, you had to have for anal exposure up to four doses in a week. So if you didn't have four doses in a week, that's when you're at risk for getting HIV where those three seroconversions occurred. They noticed that adherence with those four doses of a week really start to taper off the longer people were in the trial. Um, and they saw this really more so in adolescent clinical trials than they saw in trials that were with adults. And so they really want to raise attention to the fact that with adolescent populations, you have to pay attention to adherence. Some of the things that people said as to why they stopped taking their medication were things like, I was worried that others would see me taking my pills and they would think I had HIV. It's very common. People are oftentimes worried that people are going to see Truvada and think it's an HIV pill. I'm concerned that people will know I have sex with other men, so they think it's going to out them. Um, and then I don't like taking pills. <laughs> I think that um, this is one of my favorite quotes because with PrEP, you are dealing usually with people who are very healthy, who do not have a lot of comorbidities, and who are coming to the doctor just for prevention visits. So taking a pill every day is a huge shift for them. Okay, so that's background. We're going to move to the fun aspects of prescribing PrEP. So the first thing I want to emphasize is that CDC in 2021 updated their guidance saying that you really should be telling anyone who's sexually active, I want to educate you about PrEP. So anyone who says, yes, I have sex. You should say, well, let me tell you about all the different options that are available for you in regards to HIV prevention, including something called PrEP. Um, this is a shift because I think it's trying to move away from this idea that you only want to talk to people who are high risk, who engage in high risk sexual activity, because you only have to have sex once to get HIV. Um, and because we know that the prevalence is so high in the South, um, specifically, most people do not report actually having more than two sex partners um, in the past six months when they get HIV. It's not usually uh, a high number of sex partners. So they really want to shift our conversation around this and educate everybody. And then they have an algorithm that helps in regards to how you can go down with whether you just educate or you say, you know, PrEP may be something that I think would be beneficial for you. And so if someone's reporting anal or vaginal sex in the past six months, that takes you down your yes pathway. If they have an HIV positive partner and that partner is not on antiretroviral therapy, they're not taking medication for their HIV, so they have a detectable viral load, then PrEP is probably something you really want to talk to them about. But remember, if they are on HIV medication and they are undetectable, you equals you, they're not going to transmit the virus to their partners. So you can still educate about PrEP, but it's not something that you have to say, I think this is something that you may want to consider. If you have one or more sex partners and you don't know their HIV status, and I usually tell most people, you don't know your partners anything <laughs> because most people really don't unless you're looking at results um, and you're not consistently using condoms you may want to discuss PrEP and say, this might be beneficial for you. And then there's some studies that discuss that with certain bacterial STIs, you're at higher risk for a future diagnosis of HIV. 
So specifically for men who have sex with men and that's MSM, if they've had gonorrhea, chlamydia, or syphilis in the past six months, they're more likely to receive a diagnosis of HIV in the future. So we usually say you might want to consider PrEP. For vaginal sex, for men who have sex with women and women who have sex with men, it's really gonorrhea and syphilis. Um, chlamydia is so common, it doesn't really predict future HIV diagnosis for that population. It's just kind of everywhere. Okay, so, and just remember all patients, you should discuss PrEP with them. Okay, so if you're at this point where you think, I've gone through my sexual history and you know how your rock stars in taking a sexual history now, and you say, okay, I think PrEP may be an option for you. Let's talk about what does it mean to start someone on PrEP? There's a couple of steps you have to do before you can actually prescribe PrEP. So the first thing is you have to establish a negative HIV diagnosis. So the first thing that you really want to do is number one, take a really good history. You want to make sure that there's no acute signs and symptoms of HIV. Stop me at any point in time if you have questions. So acute signs and symptoms usually means that you've had sex recently and you're saying, oh, you know, I've actually had a flu-like illness. I've had fever. I've had swollen lymph nodes. I have a sore throat. I have a rash, even diarrhea. Those would be indications for you to wait, check something like a viral load, which is what we use to, to assess for acute HIV infection. And say, some people will wait usually until you've had that viral load return back and then have more counseling to start PrEP or even do something depending on the window, like post-exposure prophylaxis to PrEP if it's within 72 hours. Or if you're worried about real acute HIV infection, with that PEP, you're actually starting them on ART. So you have the opportunity to repeat testing. Um, because remember, it takes time for that antigen antibody to come back positive. So that fourth generation antigen antibody testing. So if they don't have acute signs and symptoms of HIV, you can do a fourth gen antigen antibody test. Um, that usually, you have a four week window, it's actually usually about two. You do the test, if it's negative, within one week, you can start PrEP. Some people are fine with same day prep, but the guidelines from CDC say within one week you can start prep. Um, the other things that we like to screen for are STIs. We also like to check their creatinine clearance because this affects what type of prep you can give them. And I'll go through that later on in the talk. Some other labs that we always check for is hepatitis B because a lot of our prep options for, for prescribing prep Treat hepatitis B. So you want to make sure that you check for this. And this is active infection, not signs of recent vaccination. And then if it's someone who has the ability to become pregnant, you might want to do a pregnancy test. PrEP is safe in pregnancy. It's safe with contraceptives. Um, so this isn't something that you have to do, but sometimes a person would want to know because they want to know what they are taking if they are pregnant. So these are our options. This is our like awesome table. You have this in a badge, buddy. Um, but this is what it means, essentially. So we have different populations and what's been approved for those populations based off who was in the clinical trials. The awesome part is Truvada is approved for all populations. So cisgender men, transgender men, cisgender women, and transgender women. Everyone can get Truvada. Pregnant people can get Truvada. Adolescents can get Truvada. You can get it for all types of sex, including if you are injecting drugs. So that's an indication for that as well. The only thing is that your kidneys have to be pristine. So if someone has one kidney, which I've had a patient who had one kidney, I did not prescribe Truvada for them. Um, if someone does not have creatinine clearance greater than 60, you cannot give them Truvada. So that leads us to our other options. So just I have a question about that. Yes. Um, so yeah. So, like, is 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 having one kidney a, a hard stop, or is it just as long as their creatinine clearance is above sixty? Because a lot of the time, people who have a congenital absence or an early nephrectomy are still going to have a reasonable creatinine clearance. So the person that I had who had one kidney, their kidney was already starting to have some signs of um, not functioning appropriately. They had protein in their urine. So I didn't want to put them at increased risk. And I just said, I think we can do the SCOBY and you. If you have someone who has one kidney that's a well-functioning kidney, I think it's fine. That's not a contraindication. Yeah, do we expect that the medications are, are causing any renal damage? 
or is it just because of you know dosing and you know therapeutic levels? Yes, it's just renally cleared. It's not actively causing renal damage. Sure. Okay. Is there any reason to aside from that? Is there any other good reason to give Viscovy? I don't believe so. <laughs> I, I think Truvada is a great medication. Like I said, it's generic. Um, I the only other population, and we have like a nice little thing for this, is people who are at risk for fractures who have osteoporosis. So it does cause a decrease slightly in bone mineral density. Um, that's not doesn't have real clinical relevant. Um, sorry, relevance in cl clinical trials for adolescent populations because they have great bones, but. In the studies that were done with adults, specifically men who were older than 50 who smoked cigarettes and were at high risk for fractures, um, there were, I think, two fractures that occurred with Truvada. So for those individuals, I don't give Truvada. I will give them Descovy because um, it, it does decrease your bone mineral density. It just does. Any other questions? Okay. So yeah, Descovy is not generic. It is only brand. And a lot of times you might actually get a kickback if you try to prescribe Descovy first. So you really have to have a good reason to prescribe, um, prescribe Descovy if you're prescribing this. Um, so the only populations it's approved for is for cisgender men, for transgender men who have anal sex and for transgender women who have anal sex. So really for anal exposure only, because that's the only population that was approved for in the trials. Um, no cisgender women were included in the original trials. It's not approved for pregnant people. Um, so yeah, <laughs> you can't prescribe it for that. Uh, you see here the lower creatinine clearance and it doesn't have the same side effects on bone mineral density. The thing that it does cause is it cause, and it's been associated with hyperlipidemia. So you can get hyperlipidemia with Descovy and you can also get weight gain with Descovy. And then the other rock star that we've included on here, but we don't go into detail about is capitagravir, which is the injectable option. The reason why we don't go in detail is because there's a lot of barriers with actually accessing injectable capitagravir. Um, on average, it's about $20,000 a year in cost. Um, but it's great. It's an injection every two months. It's been approved for most populations. And some people might want this as an option for them. So if you're interested in then we in this option for your clinic, we do have a prep champion that you can talk to about how you can implement capitagravir in your clinic. So this is the nice algorithm that we have that kind of walks you through our thought process and a lot of experts thought process on why you would say, okay, I want to do Truvada versus Descovy. And remember TDF FTC is Truvada, TAF FTC is a pro drug. Um, and it's Descovy. So all people who sex at birth are female have to get Truvada. If you were assigned sex at birth male, Descovy may be an option for you. The only reason you would do Descovy is if you had chronic kidney disease or risk factors for osteoporosis. Then that's the populations I consider that in. Um, the other things that you want to consider are things like hyperlipidemia and weight gain, because if that's an issue, which we do have patients that's an issue for, then you would want to do something like Truvada. And again, I think Truvada is great for mostly all populations because there's not many um, contraindications for that medication. So if you're going to prescribe an oral option, usually we can give 30 pills with two refills because you see people every three months. Um, for repeat HIV and STI testing. The biggest barrier is usually insurance. Um, this is a no cost, zero cost sharing drug. It has a grade A um, rating. So there should not be co-pays for people who have insurance, but they still occur. So you may have to um, talk to insurance companies about that and argue and say, you shouldn't be um, giving my patient a copay for this. You might have to have prior authorizations that come through 
that you have to deal with. Again, we have a prep champion to help with that. Um, and if you're using generic Truvada, there shouldn't typically be any cost with the medication itself. That's usually a barrier, but the cost with the visits that are every three months can sometimes be a barrier depending on the insurance coverage your patient has. The only thing I want to review in regards to the injectable cabotegravir, which we think is very important, is the reason why for our follow-up visits now, we really recommend also checking viral loads if you have someone on, especially long-acting cabotegravir. The reason why is because when they did the clinical trial, HPT and 083 just rolls off the tongue. They did this clinical trial. And what they found is that people who were actually taking this medication, they had high enough drug levels. It wasn't an issue of adherence. They seroconverted. They got HIV. And because this is such a rock star, strong, long acting drug, there was a delay in diagnosing their HIV with regular HIV testing with antigen antibody testing. And so these individuals actually develop resistance to integrase inhibitors. And that's one of the main backbones that we have for treating HIV with single tablet regimens that are nice and cute and tiny, have few side effects. It doesn't mean that if someone were to seroconvert on this, we don't have options. We do. It's just, they have more side effects. Okay. So we have this awesome table, just real quick summary of what you can prescribe for what populations. Um, and I wanted to just do a little shout out because there is something called on demand or 211. This is not something that is FDA approved, um, but you can prescribe it off label. And this is really around sex acts. So for Truvada, you can take two pills at least two hours before a sex act. And you take one pill 24 hours after that. And then the second pill the second day and you're covered. So for someone who can actually predict, they say, I'm going to have sex on Saturday. I don't have sex frequently, but I know Saturday I'm going to have sex. You can say, oh, well, two and one may be an option for you if they don't want to take daily pills. Okay, so that's initiating prep. When it comes to monitoring, this is what your follow-up visits are going to look like. So a lot of people get a little hung up on this because it is this every three-month visit. But the reason why they want to do every three month visits is really for the antigen antibody HIV testing and the viral load testing really necessary for long acting. If you have someone who's having um, unprotected, so no barrier protection sex, you might want to do STI testing at all sites where they're having sex at that three month visit. Um, they don't really recommend it unless it's usually for anal sex because rates are typically higher. Just based off the site. And then for vaginal sex, you really should do it at least every six months. Renal function, you only have to test really every year if someone's less than 50 and they have normal renal function. If they're greater than 50, we test renal function every six months. And really at every visit, you should be checking in and saying like, are there any barriers? Do you still want to take PrEP? Do you think PrEP is still for you? And assess adherence. The other things we like to do um, really, I think, is with the hepatitis B, and I, I didn't emphasize this enough, you check that at initiation, but you don't have to check that at any other point in time unless there are continuing risk factors for someone to get hepatitis B. If someone were to have hepatitis B and you treat them with Truvada or Descovy, you are treating their hepatitis B infection. And the concern is that this is all hypothetical. If you were to stop treatment, they could have an acute flare. So we counsel everybody, hey, if you have hepatitis B and you did not meet criteria for treatment, very few people do, and we treat this with your medication for PrEP, there is a rare likelihood that you could have a flare. WHO says it shouldn't be a barrier for you starting. They have seen very few cases of this actually occurring. It usually actually only occurs in people who have HIV, but we still counsel on it. A question on that. Yep. The, uh, since, since some of these medications basically treat hepatitis B, um, do they have any like effect of essentially like pre-exposure prophylaxis for hepatitis B as well? So you mean like, does it prevent you from getting hepatitis B infection? Yeah. 
basically, since, you know, that you said it's treating the hepatitis yeah. B, so it's, you know, working as an antiviral, so it would almost make sense that it might have some effect that way. It, it doesn't, unfortunately. Um, the only other thing that I like to counsel people on, because this is reasons why people start or will stop taking it, is I tell them, hey, just so you know, there are some common side effects, especially with oral medications. So you can get a little bit of diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. Some people report headache. Usually that happens in the first couple of weeks and it goes away. So if they have it, I say, we can give you something for this. There's a lot of... A, not now, but there used to be a lot of scary ads about Truvada specifically. There were lawsuits, all kinds of stuff. It's all fake. Um, <laughs> it's not real. It doesn't really hurt uh, kidneys like they said it did. But I like to tell them up front, if you have normal kidneys, I think you'll be fine. This is safe medication. For older patients, I talk to them about things like Descovy. Um, and same thing with bone mineral density. Okay, so... How quickly are you protected? So we talked about two on one, but that is if you take two pills up front. If you're just taking a daily pill, um, technically we tell people it's about a week before you have protection with anal exposure. With vaginal exposure, it's 20 days. So it's a hot minute <laughs> before you have enough drug in your system to say if you were exposed to HIV, you would not get infected. We don't really have data on TAP FTC or cabotegravir, um, so we can't really say for sure. If you were to stop an oral regimen, it takes about a week for it to get out of your system. We included injectable on here in case you ever start somebody on this, because the biggest thing with injectable is it lasts in your system for up to a year. Um, it's long acting. So typically we tell people that we recommend that if they were to stop, they do an oral regimen until it's completely out of their system. When it comes to adherence for anal exposure, you really only have to take it four times a week and it's effective. It's like 96% effective, which is great. Um, sometimes, you know, habits are habits for a reason. So we tell people try to take it every day <laughs> if you can, because sometimes, you know, Four days a week becomes two days out of the week, and then you end up seroconverting. For vaginal exposure, they really say that you need to take it kind of every day. Um, that's what expert opinion is for you to have high enough protection. And then there are some people who have concerns about things like behavioral compensation. So if I'm on PrEP, does that mean that I engage in higher risk sexual behavior? So there's been mixed data in regards to whether you have higher STI rates for people who start PrEP. Um, but what we really feel is that you're providing an option to individuals who had a higher likelihood of being diagnosed with HIV. And so we are doing a good public health service. We are being good public health stewards and giving them options available to prevent HIV diagnosis. Um, HIV diagnosis is a lifelong diagnosis. It is something that is treatable and should not impact livelihood, but we know that there's still a lot of stigma attached with HIV. So PrEP is a wonderful option that we like to educate everybody about. And then to support adherence, I give people all kinds of stuff. I give them like daily pill dispensers. I give them keychain pill dispensers. I tell them to set an alarm on their phone or put it next to their toothbrush if they're not worried about um, someone seeing their pills. So that's something you can talk to them about when you're doing adherence counseling at follow-up visits. Okay, we're in the last phase of this talk, which is nuts and bolts. So this really is just talking about the actual structural barriers to accessing PrEP. And with adolescent populations specifically, one of the biggest barriers for any type of sexual health care is confidentiality. So we're gonna talk a little bit about something called the Cures Act. I think most people are familiar with this, but this is the act that went forward that said, you have the right as a patient to have access to your records. That's why we have all these awesome patient portals. You can see all your labs, your patients are like, I saw red, what happened? With adolescent populations specifically, unless you have a separate portal for them, that means their parents have access to their labs sometimes. That means their parents can have access to them being on PrEP. So number one, we recommend everybody 
um, when you're providing services for adolescents, just know what your electronic medical record is like. Do you have a separate security access point for adolescents? Some places do where they can create a separate record for their adolescent patients so that parents don't have access to their records. Um, for prep care for adolescents, we do, if their parents are supportive, recommend trying to engage parents in those conversations. If parents and guardians are not supportive, then I think that's a separate issue. And you try to empower the adolescent and talk about what they can do to prepare themselves if there's an unintentional disclosure. Here are some of the billing codes that you can use to bill for PrEP services. Um, these should not hopefully re result in you getting any prior authorizations. And then we always emphasize that Truvada is $4 at Walmart and Winn-Dixie. The other thing that we offer to you all is, like I said, most of the costs associated with PrEP are with the visits. There are still assistance programs for the medications, especially things like Descovy. So there are access and links on here about how you could go to Gilead to help to pay for those drugs if that's a barrier for your patient. But then we also provided what you can do for your patients who are insured versus those who are not insured and how you can help pay not only for their medication, but also do things like help them enroll um, and hopefully get insurance if that's an option for them. Medicaid here does cover PrEP, just as an FYI. The only Medicaid that doesn't cover PrEP is Medicaid that is for reproductive purposes only. And this is what that Gilead Medication Assistance Program looks like. And there's also a government program called Ready, Set, Prep that covers Truvada and Descovy that you can enroll your patients in. And then after that, we just have some resources that are available to you and then places that you can refer your patients to if there's a concern for disclosure and you don't have a system in place that will prevent their parents from being able to access their systems. Okay, that's it for PrEP 101 prescription. And then unless there's questions here, I'm gonna shift and we're gonna do case based and you guys have to like talk and engage and you're gonna tell me how you're gonna prescribe PrEP. Any questions? There's a lot of information. Was the um, two on one, was that uh, exclusively for people who engage in anal intercourse or? Okay. Yes. That's up. Thank you. And it's only for Truvada. Any other questions? Okay. Let me remember how to use Zoom, which is difficult. Where's my little stop share thing? Mm. It should be, it might be on your other screen. I always have like a weird thing that happens where I somehow forget how to use Zoom for no I I, reason whatsoever. I can make it so you can stop. Maybe. Let's see. Thank um, you. Okay. okay. Prep champion. Yay. And then swap. Okay. This part should be quick, but this part requires, like I said, optimal engagement because you're going to go through a case and you're going to help with discussions about how you would start someone on prep based off all the wonderful knowledge you just gained. So we're going to review. First, I'm going to just tell you again why it's important for you in your role in the study to be a PrEP champion. And we're going to focus a little bit on inequities with PrEP specifically, because we didn't talk about that. We're going to talk about what does it mean to be a PrEP champion, and then we're going to go through the case. So some people find this very shocking. I personally do. But there's about 1.2 million people who we predict have an indication for PrEP. Um, only 18% of persons with an indication are currently prescribed. There's actually a recent report that came out that said this number was better, it's 30%, but it's mostly um, white men who are receiving prescriptions for PrEP right now. Not any really people of color, 
and especially not women. And that has not improved since 2012. So the concern is that if we don't get uptake specifically among populations that we know are more likely to be diagnosed with HIV, that we're gonna see just widening gaps in regards to disparities. The other thing that we're seeing is that after you just look at disparities with PrEP linkage alone, when we're looking at things like PrEP persistence, and this is based off Kaiser Permanente data, we saw that individuals who are Black and Hispanic were less likely to be retained in PrEP care. And then for those who discontinued, unfortunately, they were more likely to seroconvert and develop HIV. And then this last graph, I think, really just emphasizes the fact that this idea that you're going to have this amplification of disparities has already had some proof of concept. So this is one equity measure that we look at when we look at PrEP. And we say, okay, how many people are getting PrEP compared to who is getting an HIV diagnosis? And it's called a PrEP to need ratio. The higher the PrEP to need ratio is, the better. And so what you're seeing in these corners is geographic areas, Midwest, West, Northeast, and South. And the PrEP to need ratio has increased over time, which is great. But what you see with the purple line is that it's increased really mostly among white individuals, minimally among Hispanic individuals, and almost not at all among Black individuals. In the area that has the highest PrEP prescription, which is the Northeast, you actually see the widest gap. Um, so again, just proof of concept of this idea that you're going to have this amplification of inequities. And then unfortunately, this is just showing you this puny amount of females who are getting prescribed PrEP in this graphic. Um, and so even with, I think what we're excited about, which is gains and seeing prescription among men, um, we're seeing still disparities among men and who's being prescribed among men. And then really almost no women are being prescribed. So there's lots of issues in regards to why women aren't prescribed PrEP. And there's some that are individual level barriers. A lot of women don't know that PrEP is for them. That's why we're trying to change the narrative and say PrEP is for everybody. If you're sexually active, it could be for you. Um, costs and side effects can be a barrier. A lot of people don't trust PrEP. Um, they think PrEP is something that is for people who have HIV and there's a lot of stigma with HIV, so they don't want to take it. Um, and people are worried about what does it mean if someone sees me on PrEP and my partner sees that, what are they going to think about me? So these are some things that you may have to discuss with your patients before they're willing to actually engage in PrEP care. So your role in the study, you are a PrEP champion. What does it mean to be a PrEP champion? You are experts. You've gone through this long training and now you are considered experts. And Really what an expert is, is anybody who's willing to go out and seek knowledge. And that means that you've gotten this base level of knowledge. And if you come into issues or barriers, you're willing to ask and reach out and try to troubleshoot and overcome those barriers and engage other people at your clinic and say, this is how we're going to increase prep access at our site. So your advocates, you're going to act as liaisons for other sites. You're going to share and disseminate how you were able to implement best practices at your site. And really, I think, again, just troubleshoot those challenges and try to think about ways and solutions to move forward. For the study specifically, there's a couple of tools that we've given you all as prep champions. So you've gotten your sexual history screening tool, which is that nice paper form that patients can fill out before you even come into the room if there's concerns about, I think, patients wanting sometimes to have um, their, their, their providers not know or judge them for their sexual history and what they're engaging in, in regards to sex acts, they can fill that out and you can discuss it based off of that. We have tons of flyers that focus really on this idea of confidentiality because we know that's a barrier for a lot of people, especially adolescents and talking about sexual health and HIV prevention. You have your badge buddies that go over prep prescription and taking a sexual history. There is a web page that has all of these talks. It has all of these lectures. It has everything. And then you have a prep champion consultant named Michael Fordham who works at my clinic where we prescribe prep and he's great. He has like color-coded Excel documents. He can walk you through any um, barriers you may encounter. The other thing that we hope that you will do as a prep champion is you will train residents at your site on how to take a sexual history, how to prescribe PrEP. 
you're going to hopefully be able to meet um, with whoever is at your clinic who's helping you navigate prep services and talk to them if you've identified barriers with insurance, with prior authorizations, try to work through that. And then hopefully have a community of practice, communicate with others who are prep champions and again, troubleshoot and try to figure out how you work through any clinical cases that you saw that were interesting, barriers you encountered with taking a sexual history or prescribing PrEP. We hope that you'll be willing to give this sheet to whoever the person is who's helping you navigate um, insurance with your PrEP patients, because hopefully it will help with some barriers they may face in regards to paying for PrEP or paying for the services associated with PrEP. And then this is Michael Fordham. He's great. This is who you can reach out to if you have issues that you run into. He's our consultant. Okay, so here's our case. So this is Tiffany. Tiffany's a 20-year-old female. She's presenting to her PCP complaining of a painless ulcer she noticed on her labia two days prior. She denies having any other symptoms. On sexual history, she reports one sex partner in the past 12 months. They no longer use condoms. And she engages in vaginal, anal, and oral sex with that partner. She has not noticed any lesions on her partner. Tiffany has STI screening and is positive for primary syphilis. She's treated with penicillin and expresses she is concerned about how she got this STI. So at this point in time, can you walk me through, anyone, how you would talk to Tiffany and potentially educate her about PrEP and HIV prevention? Don't all jump at the chance. You can do it. <laughs> Thank you so guys. Well, I guess to begin with, she's at an increased risk already because she's got been tested positive for an STI. Um, I would start with that. Um, and well, according to what we discussed, you know, she's an African-American female. She's already, you know, also at an increased risk um, with that, in that sense, you know, in that regard, she is sexually active, you know, doesn't use protection. So, um, you know, she would qualify for um, prep, I would, I would say. Um, so I guess going through this, um, I don't know, first of all, am I going the right way here? Before I keep... <laughs> so you are so the reason why we do this is because of a couple of things there's one way that we think through things as clinicians and as providers and there's another way that we communicate this to patients so yes we know rates are higher among black women but a lot of times when we communicate especially to black or hispanic women or black or hispanic men to say you're a black woman and therefore you're at high risk for HIV is going to not make them potentially want to take something like PrEP or be engaged with HIV prevention services. And so same thing with her having this painless ulcer that we now know as syphilis. Um, so typically when I'm educating people about PrEP, you've gone through the algorithm in your mind. You're like, yes, I want you to be on PrEP. <laughs> I think this is something that would be beneficial for you. When I'm talking to my patients, I say things like, so, you know, number one, a lot of times their first question is, how did I get this? And I say, syphilis is transmitted through sex. I can't really speak to your partner, but what we can focus on today is your sexual health, your goals, and what we can do for you um, to accomplish those goals. As a part of that, I want to educate you about all of the ways that you can protect yourself. Because what we do know is that with things like syphilis, um, and other sexually transmitted infections that the likelihood of in the future being diagnosed with HIV can be higher. And so something like PrEP may be a good option for you. Have you heard about PrEP? And then kind of let that be an opening to see what they've heard. And a lot of times they'll say, well, oh, that's that medication. And this is because this is how this has been advertised. Oh, I think I thought I saw that. And I think it's only for gay men. And we say, no, actually it's for all populations. <laughs> um, this is a great prevention tool that anyone can use. And 
again, we think that this is something that would be beneficial for most people as an empowerment because if you don't feel confident in being able in your sex to say, I want to use a condom, then you can actually use PrEP to protect you against HIV and not have to be concerned about what your partner is doing at that point in time. So I always try to focus on it as an aspect of empowerment for my patient. Focus on their behaviors, their health, and not the behaviors and health of their partners. So you did a great job. Okay, so let's say Tiffany says, oh, you know, this doesn't usually happen, but she says, oh, this is great, Dr. Elopre. Thank you. <laughs> I want to start prep today. What are the things that you would have to do to initiate her on prep? So we want to get antibody, antigen testing, viral load, hep B, hep C, renal function, lipids, if we're going to do um well that would be more for discovia that's not first line so the other ones i mentioned that's great can she do discovy no well is she she's a cisgender woman with that yeah so no she cannot that's correct so yes you would do all the things that you said so to review we would do hiv testing and we put this up here so you remember the windows. So if you were to do a viral load, if you talk to Tiffany, Tiffany says, oh, I had sex a week ago and I am right now feeling like I have a sore throat, I have mono-like illness, you would want to do something like a viral load or a gnat. The typical window is anywhere from 10 to 33 days, but we usually tell people a week. For your antigen antibody, fourth generation testing is typically a month two to four weeks. And then this is really not what we want to do. So if someone comes in and they said, I did an or quick, it's three months. We don't start people on prep from or quick. The other things, all the things that you guys mentioned. So we talked, we did get sexual history. We discussed prep. We get all the hepatitis B testing you're talking about. And let's say we check the hepatitis B and it looks like she doesn't have active infection, but she hasn't been vaccinated. A lot of people at that point will use it as an opportunity to vaccinate Tiffany. We test for STIs. Tiffany had vaginal, oral, and anal sex. So where do we want to test Tiffany for STIs? Everywhere. Everywhere. So you test at all sites. Um, and this can be self-collected. So you can do an oral swab. Usually that is required for the provider to do, but you can do your own vaginal swabs. The patients can, and they can do their own anal swabs. And then if we want to prescribe, so for step three, we're going to prescribe. So you've done all of the, again, great counseling for her. You give her her wonderful prescription. And the next part of your case, is she comes back and she sees you and she says, I've been having issues with adherence. So we talked about this a little bit. <laughs> she comes back and she says, I've been having issues with adherence. I've only been taking it maybe two to three times a week. What would you counsel Tiffany about at this point in time with her having the issues with adherence? So I, I would first um, address whether or not she has concerns about somebody else finding out that she's taking it. Um, and then the things that you had mentioned before, um, you know, put it next to your toothbrush. Um, so, you know, it's there every night, set an alarm on your phone, have a, you know, daily pill, pill case that you can, you know, put it in on a daily basis and then also have it maybe on a keychain. So when you, if you know you've forgotten to take it, at least you have it there with you anytime you do remember. Wonderful. So yes, very top-notch adherence counseling. What would you tell Tiffany about her risk for getting HIV at this point in time with her only taking it two to three times out of the week? Uh, that she would have an increased risk of seroconverting uh, if she doesn't take it at least four times a week. So that's why adherence is so important. Uh, uh, kind of 
uh, defeats the point of taking it if you're not taking it on a consistent basis. So. so it's great. So remember for vaginal exposure, it's actually six to seven days out of the week. Anal exposure is only four. So Tiffany really has to take it every day. I think of it kind of like birth control pills. <laughs> if you don't yeah. take it, it doesn't, yes. So this is something that's really common. Again, um, you want to do adherence counseling every time you see them. And what's important, Spencer, that you didn't say is that you wouldn't stop her prep. So we don't recommend you stopping prep. If someone gets HIV while on prep, specifically oral prep, so TDF, FTC, we can still treat them with our standard first line HIV regimen. So it's fine. Um, well, it's not fine. They have HIV. <laughs> But it's fine in the sense that we still want to keep them engaged. Hopefully we can get their PrEP adherence better. And we don't want to say, oh, PrEP's not for you. You're not taking it appropriately. I'm not going to prescribe it for you anymore. So always address the things that we discussed. The other things that can be barriers, and this is great because you guys are PCP providers, so you can assess all of this, are things like mental health transportation, all the things that you can think of that make it hard to come in every three months. And so you can assess that as well. Okay, guys, that is the whole talk. <laughs> you guys did great. That's it. Um, we gave a couple of other resources in regards to clinical care options. This is a place that offers CME, um, and they have talks about how you can optimize using oral prep, how you can do potentially every six month visits instead of every three. Um, and then something called doxy post-exposure prophylaxis, which is specifically um, doxycycline that's used to prevent gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis for anal exposure. Um, so tons of great talks. We just wanted to give this to you if you want to become even more enriched with knowledge in regards to sexual health. But that's it. Is there any last minute questions? Yes. Um, let's see. So a few things, um, you mentioned the guidelines state uh, one, week one week waiting period to initiate PrEP um, after the initial visit, but that some people do same day initiation. Um, and I mean, so what's, what's, what's the thinking for, for both of these? Like, is there a particular, aside from having back your HIV test, is there a good reason to wait a week? So honestly, I support same day because a lot of times to have people wait a week, you lose them. <laughs> um, and so if someone's there and they're like, yes, I'll, I'll take prep today. I'm like, here's the prep. <laughs> you getting a week of prep and let's say you have HIV is not going to typically lead to any kind of um, resistance. We just start you on a full course HIV regimen. And so if we start people same day, we typically say, now we're doing this, we will call you, we do appropriate HIV counseling about your HIV test results. If you were to test positive, we would have to change this regimen to a full HIV regimen. That would be additional medications, usually one additional medication to this prep regimen that you're on. I also, um, just as a point of HIV testing, a lot of people know, are there they'll say like, if you get called back in in person, that means you tested positive. I call, so you should really just call everybody back in. <laughs> so there's not like this fear of being called back in, but yes, same day I think is fine to do. Great question. I have another one. I've, I've got another one, but I'm still trying to remember what it was. Um, <laughs> do, do my two residents have any questions? That was very thorough. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Oh, it was I, something to do. Um, trying to think, it was something else with initiation. I think. Um, hmm. Yeah. So one thing that Fernando mentioned was like, you know, I just, wait. It was almost on the tip of my head here. Well, let me let me ask this other one. So one thing he he mentioned was um, Hep C testing, right? And I, I try to catch people for hep C tests, especially my older patients a lot more um, because I've, I've caught a, uh, essentially like a, you know, an, an asymptomatic uh, hep C on one of my older patients that he probably got a long, long time ago and has been, you know, semi-suppressed. Um, 
but kind of what's your thinking on um, on testing for Hep C in these uh, this population? You mentioned it's not necessarily recommended for like with cisgender women, um, but is there? I mean, is that something you would still just do anyway? I mean, technically, guidelines say that everybody should be tested with, for hepatitis C one point in their lifetime, regardless of risk. So if this is that one point, then it's an opportunity. So. I, I don't mind doing hepatitis C testing as a part of like the panel for, for prep. I'm all for testing. So <laughs> that's, that's my stance as um, a prep provider, as an HIV um, prevention specialist. Um, you mentioned that it's uh, that the generic um, of Truvada is like you said, $4, like $4 a month. Is that the cost? Mm-hmm. Okay, so basically, like very, very cheap, um, and uh, if and you you've got on your on I guess I guess on all this kind of uh, our little handouts and stuff, um, are you insured to cover prep cost? And you know, saying like there are assistance programs, but um, I guess the question would be: Do any of the uh, what was it like Title Ten clinics or whatever? Do the, some of them just give it out for free since it's so cheap, or do they have funding for that, or you still end up having to pay? That's a good question. So number one, most Title 10 clinics are like family planning clinics, don't offer prep services in the state of Alabama. Um, we have two health departments that offer prep in the state of Alabama, Jefferson County and Mobile. That's the only ones that I know of. Yeah. Um, and then... We have several community-based organizations that offer PrEP services. Now, typically the community-based organizations have 340B programming. And with that, they can offer PrEP free of charge for people who are uninsured. Um, so that's that list of, of CBOs that we have on the slide deck. If one of those in like, CBOs are within your area, you could always refer someone who's uninsured who might have issues paying for the visits to a CBO that can hopefully cover that cost. And so our health our state health department really partners with CBOs and says, we're going to give funding to CBOs so CBOs can dispense prep. Okay. Any other questions? If you have a patient that has like a comorbid STI that's diagnosed on screening, um, does that uh, complicate initiating PrEP at all? No, um, not at all. And none of the medications that you would treat um, for any bacterial STI or viral STI would complicate or be a contraindication for you to prescribe PrEP. Um, you mentioned the, uh, obviously the hepatitis B um, issue uh, going off of that. So uh, presumably it's the Truvada and the Discovy that are effective for treatment of hepatitis B. And are they like totally effective as monotherapy or are they kind of like, and eh, you could use them, like if you were just treating chronic hep B in a patient with suppressive you know, therapy, um, is that what you would use? Yes. Okay. It, it's, yeah. it's like a complete treatment regimen for, for hepatitis B. So they are, they are getting treated. Um, okay. so, so realistically, the only thing that would be different if they had hepatitis B would be assuming that they don't have like, you know, decompensated cirrhosis or something going on, um, would essentially be that you would want to make sure you did really good counseling about it, medication adherence and that the risks of coming off of it. Exactly. And, you know, for hepatitis B, I always have to, even as an infectious disease provider, I pull up my table where I'm like, what are all the requirements for someone who needs, you know, treatment for hepatitis B? And it's based off of your liver enzymes, based off of your um, viral load and your hepatitis B E antigen. Um, but most people, just general population who don't have HIV, don't meet requirements for hepatitis B treatment. So a lot of times if someone has hepatitis B and you're giving them PrEP, you're treating them unnecessarily for their hepatitis B. 
Right, because the hepatitis B is basically only, well, I, don't, I guess there's some discussion about that, but, but currently hepatitis B is only treated if they're experiencing liver damage, essentially. Yeah. Essentially, yep. Yeah. You had mentioned a theoretical possibility of like a flare if you stop the prep. Is that documented anywhere or is that just like a possibility? It's, a, it's, it's people pontificating <laughs> because of what we've seen with people who have HIV. Um, but again, so World Health Organization has actually come out and said like, this isn't really something that we think you need to be concerned about. Just, get, just go ahead and give them prep. I need people to like to think a lot <laughs> and pontificate about all the possibilities. Oh yeah, we, we love doing that with our ID doctor here too, so. <laughs> These are great questions. Do you have others? Yeah. What's that, sorry? Any other questions? These are great. No. I can't remember what my question, my, my other question was, so I'll, I'll email it if I, if I think of it. Please feel free to email at any point in time. Um, very passionate about prep. I give this talk um, a lot, but I feel like this is the most meaningful because it's like in my hometown and <laughs> I want this to be successful. Um, and so we want to be as supportive as possible in any way we can be supportive. So that's it. I think, oh, sorry, go ahead, Spencer, you unmute it. Uh, I was just going to say, so as, as far as you're concerned, um, basically everyone who's sexually active or who is at risk from your perspective would be would benefit from being on prep if they're if they don't have you know uh, documented not converted themselves and their partners uh, not been documented. Yeah, basically. <laughs> oh, I remembered my other question. Um, so, uh, so say th th this is something, you know, say, say that a person does have an HIV positive partner, right? Mm -hmm. And so we know U equals U and we, and it's true and we believe that, right? Um, how, however, uh, you know, you're, you're in, in uh, you know, infectious disease position and, um, sometimes, uh, you know, so sometimes HIV patients will blip. Mm -hmm. um with their viral loads and um you know that would presumably put their partner at risk um or they you know i guess you don't always know about their compliance with their you know intraretroviral viral therapy you hope that they're completely compliant and that they're suppressed all the time so what we say like oh yeah you're you're protected if your partner is com compliant and and you equals you like where where at the, that population do we do we just offer the prep and say hey you know if you're if you trust your partner and they're suppressed you don't have to do it um, or do we say and eh, you probably don't need to do it like you know how do you approach that situation? So I always educate about you equals you, but I say again from an empowerment standpoint, like if you want to be on prep as something that you have control over, then you should be on prep. Um, because you're correct, being suppressed means that you have to be virally undetectable or have a viral load less than 200 for greater than six months. Um, it's not like a one-off. And there are instances where people have anxiety, they have a serious life event, they travel and they have blips. Typically, the viral load has to be greater than 1,000 for you to be able to transmit. Um, but it happens. I have people who fall out of care um, because a major life event occurs and it happens. So I never tell people like, oh, your partner is in care. I don't really think you need this. If they come to me and they say, I have a partner who has HIV, I'd like to be on PrEP. I say, that sounds great. I want to make sure that you're aware of you because you, but I want you to feel empowered to prevent HIV for yourself. And so if you want PrEP, I will prescribe PrEP for you. So yes, I agree. Um, and I think a lot of times a, there hasn't been a lot of great partner studies that have been done with HIV, but there have been a lot done with STIs or a few. And partners, unfortunately, aren't typically great at predicting whether their partners have STIs or not, um, or how many partners their partner has, just in general. Um, not saying that you shouldn't trust your partner, <laughs> not saying that, but you know, you should just, you should trust yourself. That's what I tell people. Just trust yourself. <laughs> 
and do what you think is best for you. Any other questions? That's a good one. Okay. All right, guys. Prep champions. We're so excited to have you on board. Um, I think Madeline had a couple of like brief announcements about reimbursement, and then I think we're done. All right. Okay. Um, Thank you so much. You're welcome. So, Dr. Green, do you know if your administration is okay with us paying you all as prep champion? Um, I very much doubt. Well, one, I wouldn't tell the administration, but I don't think the program director would care. Um, okay. <laughs> so I can double check with her, but you know, I would I would not tell my my hospital administration. That seems like something they don't need to know. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, okay. So the way our payment system works is it's called Green Fire Sim Card, and it's basically a debit card that we can load um, based on however many hours you all uh, are doing prep champion related things. So on our website, which I sent you last week, and I'll send again or not last week, last training session, and I'll send it again today. Um, there is a link to the Prep Champion time log, and you just put in your information in that. Um, every couple of weeks, we can see how much time you've been spent doing it, and then we can pay you all. Um, and in order to set you up for that payment, we will need the address that you want me to send the card to, the date of birth, and your social. Unfortunately, UAB does require the social security number uh, for like tax reporting purposes. Um, so if you all want to email that to me individually, or if you want to call me and give it to me individually, that is perfectly okay. Um, and just let me know if you have any other questions. Alrighty. Well, I'll wait your email. Okay. Thanks. What's a good callback number for you, Madeline? 205-540-2144. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll talk to you all soon. Bye, guys. Bye.